All right, so welcome everyone who's joining us this evening, the first evening in a while where it's not dark outside. Uh, welcome to Green Drinks. My name is Ginevra. I am the program coordinator at Sustainable Woodstock. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization founded in 2009. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and empower everyone to live environmentally, economically, and socially responsible lives. So we're very we're very excited to have you with us tonight and to have Alexander with us. Alexander Cotenoir grew up in Vermont's Northeast Kingdom along the shores of Lake Memlabaguk, known today as Memphermagog, where he fell in love with fishing, bird watching, and agriculture from time spent outdoors with his older sisters and his mahom, or grandfather. Alexander is a citizen of the Nulhegan Band of the Kusuk Abenaki Nation and grew up maple sugaring, carrying on a family tradition which extends back to his grandparents of the Odenac First Nation Reserve in Quebec. Alexander graduated from Dartmouth College in 2019 with a degree in environmental studies and Native American studies, where he assisted with the college's maple sugaring operations and conducted thesis research at the Hubbard Brook Research Foundation on how migratory bird populations are influenced by periodic mass tree seeding or masting events. Alexander is currently pursuing his Master of the Arts in Teaching at the George Washington University, where he is studying methods for incorporating Indigenous knowledge into science education in ways that are reciprocal and respectful. He is currently working as an assistant exhibition designer for the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where he focuses on highlighting stories of how different communities connect to, are separated from, and protect the environments they call home. So joining us from Washington, D.C., um, you can go ahead and take it away, Alexander. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, and thank you um, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody. Um, Uliani, thank you for being here today. Um, it's wonderful to be talking about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart um, and also makes me feel connected to um, my community and my family back home. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to try sharing my screen here. Um, and let me know if maybe I can just get a thumbs up if it seems to be showing up. Okay, awesome. Cool, so the presentation that I'm giving today um, is called Maple Sugaring and Askaskwiwa Doak, the Green Mountains. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing some Abenaki stories and traditions around maple sugaring with you today. Um, and I always start with a photograph um, taken from where I grew up as a nod to the place and the people who helped me get to where I am today. Um, and this photograph is actually a picture taken near my home uh, up in Derby, Newport area of Vermont. Um, one of the trails that we used to go to the sugar bush um, near where I grew up. So I want to say, first of all, so welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here again today and taking time out of your evening to learn about maple sugaring. Um, I have an opening question for everybody. Uh, I always like to hear who is in the audience and what backgrounds you're coming from and why you're interested in this topic to begin with. So my first question um, is what does sugaring mean to you? And if you could um, unmute and I'd love to hear some perspectives from who's in attendance tonight. What does sugaring mean to you? Um, they can't unmute Alexander, oh, unfortunately, because okay. I said it that way. <laughs> okay. I, can, I can allow them to if you'd like. That would be awesome if that's all right. Okay, that I think makes it so folks can. Thank you. Um, may I start, Alexander? Yeah, of course. Well, I've been around maple sugaring quite a few times in my life. And when I was a very young child, I spent summers in Southern New York State on my great grandfather's property. And it was surrounded, it was a, quite a large piece of property and it was surrounded by maple trees. And even though we were not there in sugaring season, we let our neighbors sugar. And so I grew up with maple trees that had rows of little holes because back <laughs> in those days, you know, everything was done by hand. 
And then, <clears throat> um, excuse me, um, we moved to New England and um, I spent a lot of time in Northern Vermont in Stowe and there's multiple sugar uh, companies there. And so we enjoyed the maple sugar from Vermont. Now I have a grand niece and um, she's living in Southern New York state, not far from where I spent my summers. And she and her husband produce maple sugar, they produce the um, syrup, they produce all kinds of maple products on his family's farm. So I'm very invested in maple sugar <laughs> and I love maple syrup. <laughs> Awesome. Yay. It sounds like we're from a similar point of passion. And thank you, Mary, for sharing that as well. I love what you said about the connection with your neighbor with maple sugaring. Um, and from my perspective, sugaring traditionally is a communal effort. Um, and I always say that when the steam is rising from the top of the sugar house, it's an open invitation to anybody to stop by. Um, and so I love that um, memory of just sugaring as being a time for the community to come together. So thanks, Mary, for sharing that. And thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else? In the chat, Alexander, Jane says spring, Tracy says change of the season, and Angela says connection to the land. Awesome. I love that, Angela, connection to the land. I'll be talking about that um, tonight as well. Um, well, thank you, everybody, just have, for sharing. I have oh. some uh, perspective yeah, Peter. here. Yeah. I grew up in West Woodstock, Vermont, and uh, my family made maple syrup and it definitely was a communal effort. The whole family got out there and helped. And uh, we had been sugaring uh, I, on that place that, that people had been sugaring that land for generations. Um, we did everything with uh, horses and buckets and so on when I was a kid, but eventually my dad started using the tree to tree system. I just have to say that this time, I haven't sugared for years because I haven't lived around here for a long time, but this time of year, it just gets in your blood. <laughs> There's something yeah. about it. Uh, <laughs> you feel like you ought to be out there tapping trees. So th thanks. I'm, I'm looking forward to your presentation. And thanks for being here, Peter. Um, and thanks for sharing that as well. Um, I'm actually working on a podcast right now about maple sugaring and Something that you said brought um, a quote to mind from a maple sugar in my hometown, who, when I asked um, why he has become the third generation maple sugar in his family, he said, sap runs in our veins, just like blood. Um, and I love that quote, um, kind of epitomizing how maple, maple sugaring is such a part of Vermonters experiences across, um, across the state. So one thing that I wanna to touch on before we, I jump into the presentation today is most of us from what we were just hearing and what folks were sharing coming here tonight, we're not talking about um, maple sugaring as a product, so selling. I'm not gonna be giving a presentation on the economics of maple sugaring today, even though it is a major economic driver in the state. Um, and Part of this, I would say as well, thinking about maple sugaring is we heard these words being thrown around um, and shared generational, connection to the land, connection to people. It's a collaborative effort where people come together. And that's how I think about um, maple sugaring. So I'm going to outline two of the major components to maple sugaring and how I conceptualize it um, that I'll be focusing on today. And I wanna start off with definitions because definitions are really important and how we conceptualize the words that we use. So Oxford languages defines culture as quote, the customs, the arts, the social institutions and the achievements of a particular nation, people or other social group. So I'm going to be talking about maple sugaring from this perspective. It is an achievement of a particular group of people, the Abenaki nation, from which I am speaking from today. And also it's a way to talk about our customs, our arts and social institutions. So today I'm going to be talking about how maple is a part of my family's Abenaki culture. Um, maple sugaring structures our understandings of time, 
such as our annual calendar, which I'll talk more about. Uh, it serves as a role as a teacher within our moral stories. And I'll share some of those as well. And it's also part of our traditional medicines and our ceremonies. And last but not least, um, it is a delicious source of food. So um, I chose this particular quote to start off from Alan Ogier Corbier, um, who is a member of the Ruffed Grouse clan um, of the Anishinaabe community of Mich Michigan First Nation on Manitoulin Island, which is actually located on Lake Huron. And in this quote, he says, it is certain that the maple tree has and continues to provide sustenance to the Anishinaabe in multiple ways, physical nourishment for our bodies, nourishment for our spirits, economic livelihood of our needs, philosophical meaning for diplomacy and cultural meaning in our religious ceremonies. So I love this quote because it epitomizes how multifaceted maple sugaring is from an indigenous perspective. It's used in medicines, it's used in ceremonies, it's used as a form of bartering and exchange, and also as a gift of diplomacy between indigenous tribes. And it also provides physical nourishment for our bodies. So thinking about how all of this is intertwined with culture is something of great interest to me. I'm also gonna be talking about how sugaring is really about family and memory. And my grandfather always says that sugaring was made for sharing oral history and stories. If you think about all the hours that we spend watching the fire or the evaporator pan in the process of making maple syrup, it really lends itself to self-reflection, contemplation, and storytelling. And I see sugaring as um, holding an even more important place in a world where we tend to be moving at an ever faster pace and where people don't take the time to sit down and listen to one another. From a traditional perspective as well, thinking back on the history from indigenous communities and maple sugaring practices, there were very few food harvesting activities throughout the year, aside from berry picking, sweet grass harvesting, et cetera, where there were ample opportunities for intergenerational conversations to be had. So if we think about it, even fishing and hunting tended to be more solo and quiet events um, where there wouldn't be a large group of people um, sitting in a place together talking. So just thinking about sugaring as a way to formulate memories and also create a sense of um, cohesion. I was also recently talking with my grandmother about sugaring and she made a really great point. She said that some of our fondest and our strongest memories are created when we engage all of our senses which is actually shown in scientific studies as well. If you want to remember something, you should associate that moment with a smell and a sound or multi engage multiple senses. And sugaring does all of this. It engages our sense of sight. We see glistening snow, we see bubbling snap, sap, we see the fire, we see the steam coming off the evaporator pan. It also engages our sense of smell. I always say that there's nothing like the smell of walking into a sugar house and just breathing in all the steam from the evaporator pan. But there's also the smells of spring. There's the smells of walking in wet earth or mud season as Vermonters like to call it, as the soil begins to thaw and the changing of the seasons. It also engages our sense of sound. So I always think of the bubbling, the crackling of the fire, the crunching of footsteps on, on snow and also the changing of the animal composition of the forest that you're sugaring in. So we have the arrival of migratory birds that are coming up from the south. Um, and maple sugaring also makes me think of my family because as soon as the boiling has always started, whether it's happening in our garage or my cousin's sugar house, um, which is where the, I took this photo um, in my cousin, Roger Shappett, um, we, always see it as a time that the door is open. Whenever the steam is coming up out the top of the roof, it signals that anybody can stop by, helps uh, tend the fire or help create um, the maple syrup. And sugaring is a lot of work. It requires a communal effort, which some of you shared at the opening of today's presentation, especially if you do it the old fashioned way 
um, with buckets, which is how my family um, still does it. And so I wanted to include this quote from my cousin. Um, he said, maple sugaring epitomizes the saying, many hands make light work. It's a time where everyone is eager to work hard together, but it also provides ample time to slow down and reflect on our past. We tell stories while stoking the fire or tending the evaporator pan. And I think that that's really true. It's the same as when you get together around a fire, you can almost speak through the flames. It's the same as when you're standing around and waiting for the drawing off sap and waiting for the maple um, to be ready. Um, and so I just wanted to tell you a bit about my background and why I'm talking to you on this particular topic today. Um, I was already introduced, but I just wanted to give you a little bit more of my personal background. So I wanted to say Kwai Kwai, Andaluizi, Waji, Askas Kwiwa, Zoak, Alexander Cotnoir. And I, my name is Alexander Cotnoir. I'm from um, the Green Mountains, from the Northeast Kingdom in Northern Vermont. And I actually grew up in um, Newport, um, right along the Quebec border. But my family um, is originally from Quebec. And my grandparents are from the Odenak Obeniki First Nation Reserve, um, which is located in present day Pierreville, um, Quebec, along the St. Lawrence. Um, so I grew up maple sugaring um, behind my house. Uh, one of my first memories actually is um, when my dad uh, built a toboggan that he could uh, pull us behind his snow machine out to um, the sugar patch, which was across the field out behind our house. So we would always get home from school in the evening, my sisters and I, and we would always try to clamber up to be the first one on the back of this sled um, because it was actually built um, like a traditional dog sledding sled where you could stand on the back with two places for your feet and handles. And we would drive out, um, empty all our buckets. We each had our own trees that we were in care of and in charge of. And it was always really fun. We would take tastes of the different sap from the different trees. And my sisters and I would always talk about who had the sweetest sap. So it was a really great time to kind of form connections to the land and to specific trees, um, which is another reason why sugaring is a really important way for um, indigenous knowledge transfer. And also uh, sugaring was a way for me to connect to my grandfather. Um, he actually lives about a mile from my parents' house um, through the woods. And we tapped trees on his property as well growing up. So I have a lot of fond memories of traveling trail paths through the woods, going and popping in to see my grandfather, and then talking to him as we went out and emptied the sap buckets to bring them back to our homemade uh, evaporator pan. Um, but while I was going through high school, I really started recognizing um, this interest in cross-cultural communication and how different communi communities relate to the outdoors. Um, in particular, my parents um, have been working to um, try to prevent the encroachment of the state's largest um, and only continually operating landfill from encroaching wetlands um, at the headwaters to Lake Mumford Magog, uh, which is near where I grew up. Um, and kind of, I was invited to some meetings that were between my parents and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the state of Vermont, and thinking about how different communities relate to a space and how they try to communicate their values and connections to that space was something that became very interesting to me. And so uh, fast forward, I attended Dartmouth College for my undergrad, studied environmental studies and Native American studies. And I was really fortunate when I was able to travel to work with organizations in Puerto Jimenez, Costa Rica. I spent about a half a year or so um, working to train rural and indigenous communities to water uh, to um, uh, monitor river pollution near their hometown um, as it related to agricultural runoff. And while I was in Costa Rica, I recognized a lot of similarities between problems impacting rural communities in Costa Rica and those facing communities all the way back home in Northeast Kingdom of Vermont which also made me realize the importance of communication and collaboration issues and the importance of overcoming those issues if we are to move forward um, in protecting the environment. I conducted my thesis research um, on migratory birds. And during my research, 
uh, in the White Mountains specifically, I started realizing that there are a lot of subtle ways in which colonial practice is embedded into science practices. For instance, the species I was working with was referred to as a neotropical migrant bird. Um, and that's a common word in ornithology, the study of birds is neotropical. But I started thinking about neotropical means the new tropics, but the new tropics to whom? Essentially, um, that descriptor, that seemingly benign word was showing that these birds were being described as new from the perspective of Europeans, even though there have been many, many, many generations of indigenous peoples in both South, Central and North America today who would have known these birds. Um, so just, I started thinking as well about how can I combine my interest in indigenous studies with um, science communication work? So after graduating, um, I worked in various positions. Uh, I was interned with Audubon, Vermont, um, where I created educational materials around Abenaki history and the impacts of climate change on maple sugaring. Um, I worked as a conservation educator um, with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And today I'm working on exhibitions that are examining how different communities um, interact with their local spaces at the Smithsonian. And all of this work um, comes from mentorship from my Mahome, my grandfather, um, who has served on the tribal council for the Nohican Abenaki tribe um, and has really um, instilled an interest in Abenaki heritage uh, in myself. Um, he comes from a long line of trappers um, and fishermen and hunters. And so I spent a lot of time uh, outdoors with him growing up uh, where he taught me the, um, or inspired me to begin learning the Western Abenaki language um, and also our um, cultural practices. So for today's presentation, I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement and then I'm going to go through some key concepts for today's presentation. I'm gonna go through the history and cultural significance of maple sugaring from a Fenneke perspective, including how we collected and processed sap traditionally, what we used it for, how it's reflected in our language and our stories. So I'll embed that throughout. I'll talk about this, the moral um, teachings of maple from an indigenous perspective. And then I'll talk about the sugaring operations that our tribe is doing today. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the threats to maple sugaring, um, specifically climate change, and end with um, some ways, some suggestions for how you can um, help. So before I go any further, um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the land upon which most of us are joining from today, as well as the indigenous communities who have lived and continue to reside on these lands. So I'm going to read an acknowledgement um, and I'd like everybody to take a moment and pause and reflect on the words, um, perhaps even close your eyes and think about how it makes you feel in this space. So by pausing to read this acknowledgement, it is my hope that it will encourage everyone here today to ponder the long history that has brought each of us to reside in this space and to seek to understand your part within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense, nor in a past historical context. Colonialism is a current and an ongoing process, and we need to be mindful of our present participation. Before proceeding, I'd like to add that many places in what we call the Americas today have been home to different native nations over time, and to acknowledge the fact that many indigenous people no longer live on the lands to which they have ancestral ties due to the forces of colonization, including war, disenfranchisement, disease, and forest removal. Even so, native nations, communities, families, and individuals sustain their sense of belonging to ancestral homelands and protect these connections through their traditional languages, oral traditions, ceremonies, and other forms of cultural expression. We pause to acknowledge and reflect upon the fact that our work today, located in the Green Mountains, or what most call Vermont, impacts lands which have served as a site of sustenance, community, meeting, and exchange among indigenous peoples since time immemorial. immemorial. We specifically acknowledge the Elnu Abenaki tribe, the Nolhegan Abenaki tribe, the Kohasuk additional band of the Kohas Abenaki nation, and the Missisquoi band of Abenaki 
whose homelands extend across this state. The Western Abenaki are the traditional stewards of these forests, lands, and waters, which they call Indakana, or our homeland. We respect their spiritual and lived connections to this region and remember the hardships they've endured, both past and present, including violence and forced displacement at the hands of colonizing peoples. Now, let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to the Abenaki people and to the indigenous inhabitants of these lands. We give thanks for the opportunity to share in the joys of this place and to help in protecting it. We welcome all opportunities for Abenaki citizens and other indigenous people to connect with their relations, including water, soil, plants, and animals across Vermont. So now I'm going to go through some key definitions um, during today's presentation. I I'm sure many of you um, are already aware with uh, what maple sugaring entails, but I wanted to reiterate that in the context of this presentation, I'm sticking to um, this definition of maple sugaring, the process of gathering maple sap to make into maple sugar. So recognizing that syrup um, and maple sugar or sugar can also come from the sap of silver maples, black maples, birches, and box elders. I'm focusing today's presentation specifically on sugar maples and red maples. Um, given that these two species yield the highest concentration of sucrose, and according to our oral histories and written historical accounts, these were the species we traditionally tapped um, at Abenaki sugar camps. And I also wanted to focus on this definition because um, sometimes I hear people say, oh, well, what indigenous peoples were doing was not maple sugaring. Um, they were not producing sugar on a large scale. They were not trading it. Um, they were not using it um, as a means of economic gain, um, or they didn't have sugar houses. But if we look back at the root definition of what maple sugaring is, turning sap into maple sugar, then I would argue that um, the Abenaki were doing maple sugaring and have been doing maple sugaring for a very, very long time. Um, specifically, and I'll talk about this a bit later, um, we traditionally produced sugar and not maple syrup, um, given that it's easier to uh, transport and a variety of other reasons. I'm also going to, I wanted to talk about the term Abenaki um, since there are a lot of misunderstandings uh, about what the term entails. Um, so you might notice that I use the pronunciation Abenaki. Some people say Abenaki, um, more in Vermont and New Hampshire. It basically depends on where you are from. Uh, my family is Quebecois, so I tend to use um, the pronouncing abenic, pronunciation of Beneki, but it's tomato, tomato. Um, and so there are a couple of defi um, definitions to keep in mind. Um, in the Algonquin language, this the name of Beneki actually comes from two terms, one of which is Woban, which means light, and Aki, which means land. So taken together, um, it means land of the light or people of the land of the first light, um, which has sometimes been interpreted as the people of the first dawn or the people of the dawn land, which is a reference to the fact that traditionally our communities were spread across the um, east, northeast um, of the uh, North American continent where the first light of the sun um, hits the land. So traditionally, um, Abeniki communities um, were organized around small, single, or multi-family bands, uh, not necessarily large tribes, um, but typically they would consist in groups around 20 to 300 people. Um, and during the French and English wars, uh, many Abenaki communities uh, became part of the Wabeniki Confederacy, um, which was essentially an alliance between Abeniki, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq communities. Um, as a way of trying to retain sovereignty over their um, land and their peoples. And traditionally, um, you'll see on this map that I've included on the left side of the page, um, Odenac located at St. Francis, as well as Woolenac um, up at um, the mouth of the Trois-Rivières region um, 
those are two areas where traditionally during these wars, um, back beginning as early as the 1650s, a lot of um, Abeniki communities moved north to live on missions which were established in these particular centers. So today, uh, many folks who have Abeniki ancestry have French sounding last names, given that a large portion of us um, have family living at Odenac or Wolanac. And traditionally, um, our communities included uh, many across um, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, and Southern Quebec, including the Sokoki, the Androscoggins, the Koasuk, the Missiskois, the Osipi, the Penacooks, the Pigwockets, and the Winooski peoples. But today, we consist of four um, state-recognized tribes, um, two of which were recognized in 2011, and two of which were recognized in 2012. And then there's also, I want to go over the term Western Abenaki. Um, so Western Abenaki is a linguistic definition. Um, and one of the linguists from our tribe, um, Jesse Bruchak, um, he is a Western Abenaki uh, language teacher. And he's, he describes Western Abenaki as, quote, an amalgamation of the New England native languages from Massachusetts up into Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and parts of New York. As people were displaced over about a 200 year period, communities would come together and different parts of the languages coalesced and created what we have today. It's still a spoken language and passed down from one generation to the next, yet very few people still speak it. And there are, there are now several dialects. So Western Abenaki is a linguistic dis distinction between Abenaki communities of Maine, which would be considered the Eastern Abenaki. Um, and I wanted to include a, we won't watch the whole thing, but a clip um, narrated by Jesse Ruchak um, of the Western Abenaki creation story. So you can hear um, somebody who is much more fluent than I am uh, in the language. I can't, <clears throat> I can't hear anything, Alexander. Oh, okay. Um, it might be because, let's see, if I need to share. Okay. No worries, I'll <laughs> just go to the next slide. Um, so, the next definition I want to talk to uh, talk about is indigenous knowledge. So, I talk. I'll be talking about how um, maple sugaring was a form of passing on indigenous knowledge um, from older generations and continues to be a form of indigenous knowledge transfer. So, there are lots of definitions for indigenous knowledge, and it tends to be one of these terms that's thrown around a lot. But people don't stop and think whether we're talking about the same thing. Um, there's one definition. Um, that I tend to be drawn to, and it's from um, Dr. Fikret Burke's um, book, Sacred Ecology, which is all about um, traditional ecological knowledge, um, what some people might refer to as traditional indigenous knowledge or simply indigenous knowledge, and how it is a, can be applied in various contexts, ranging from climate change studies um, to looking at uh, permaculture gardens, et cetera. So Dr. Fikret Burkes defines indigenous knowledge as a cumulative body of knowledge, practices, and beliefs evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission about the relationships of human beings, including humans, with one another and with their environment. And what I love about this definition is it talks about how indigenous knowledge is about relations. So it dictates how indigenous communities relate to one another, but also how they relate to their environments. Um, it is culturally transmitted. So it is transmitted through interactions with other people. It cannot be separated as um, written down uh, text, for instance. So I always like to make the, the point that indigenous knowledge is process instead of facts, data, and figures. So it evolves over continued relationships with a geographic place over time. Um, and there's another really interesting definition of indigenous knowledge that I've been considering more recently, 
um, which I'll talk about on the next slide, um, is um, Dr. Kim Talbear. So Dr. Talbear um, is based at the University of Alberta and she is chair of the Research Center of Indigenous People, Peoples, Techno Science and Society. And during a recent event that I attended, um, hosted by Dr. Talbear, she defined um, indigenous knowledge as any form of knowledge that ensures indigenous thriving and survival. So indigenous knowledge is not only spiritual beliefs that um, allow us to continue our spiritual practices, but also everything from hunting to fishing to harvesting practices um, that allow us to continue to um, access sustainable and culturally appropriate foods. And this ties in with indigenous sovereignty. So I'm going to talk today about how um, maple sugaring uh, being impacted by climate change uh, is a, an attack on indigenous sovereignty. So according to Jack Forbes, who is a uh, Chickahominy, sovereignty refers to freedom from foreign control. In particular, sovereignty refers to a community's relative independence from and among state, states, meaning it is relational. So what I like to say here is, although um, a nation or a state or a people's sovereignty is inherent, inherent uh, meaning it is not given or granted by an external entity, its power in the world or the ability to fully exercise one's sovereignty is based on the recognition, acknowledgement, and the respect that other groups accord to it. So for native nations as culturally distinct peoples with recognizable governments, um, their, own, uh, tribal, um, their own tribal councils, in most cases, they also have recognizable traditional treaties, um, which uh, cite their connections to land. So the sovereignty of native peoples is inherent and ancient, and it precedes the United States or the foundation of other um, colonizing countries. And so I like to bring this up, um, thinking about how is sovereignty tied with practices such as sugaring. Um, colonialism has impacted the ability of indigenous communities to exercise all forms of sovereignty, whether it be food sovereignty, the right to access and produce culturally appropriate foods, or spiritual sovereignty, the ability to access um, sacred grounds to perform traditional ceremonies. So we need to be thinking about um, how is colonialism impacting the rights of indigenous people to live in a way that is personally fulfilling to them. So now uh, jumping into maple sugaring in particular. Um, so I wanted to start off by making the point that it's not just the Beneke communities that have long traditions of maple sugaring. In fact, there are lots of communities from the Ojibwe, the Odawa, Potawatomi, um, Algonquin peoples, a Beneke, Iroquois, um, Lakota, all have, ex all have experiences and long histories with maple sugaring. And it's documented that indigenous people were collecting maple sap and boiling it down well before 1600, because we have, um, written records from Europeans in the early 1600s talking about watching Native Americans boil down the sap of these trees that they had never seen before to make it more concentrated. And there are also stories from 1620s um, recorded where indigenous, indigenous um, communities were recounting how their ancestors used the sap as medicine, showing that it preceded um, European contact. contact. But we also know that this is a long history from oral traditions as well. And what's interesting is each tribal nation and even each band or community within a tribal nation has their own names for the sugar um, of red maples and sugar maples, as well as what we would call um, like maple taffy today, um, if some of you have made sugar on snow before. And what's really cool is when you start studying these languages, you see that the names for maple sugar are very diverse, um, as diverse as the, the, the meanings behind the names are as diverse as the names themselves. For instance, from some communities, they translate to medicine tree water, 
referencing that the food was seen for where it was regarded for its medicinal purposes. Whereas others are more literally describe what maple syrup is as sugar water or street, sweet water um, in reference to its flavor. And in Western Abeniki, uh, my grandfather calls maple syrup mukwak baga, which literally translates to red water um, from the root word mukwigen, which is red. Uh, and this is in reference to the fact that when you start to boil down the sap, you get this nice golden red amber color, especially if you've ever ladled it out onto a like fresh bank of snow. Um, and this photo on the right um, is showing an Ojibwe group of elders um, at a sugar camp um, preparing uh, maple syrup. So how did we first learn to make maple sugar? Um, so many non-Indigenous people are familiar with the Iroquois legend of Wuxis and how he dis accidentally dis or uh, accidentally discovered maple syrup. So the story tells of Wuxis, um, who's an Iroquois chief who accidentally pierced the bark of a sugar maple tree um, when he threw a tomahawk into the side of the tree. And there are various explanations for how this happened. It varies from one storyteller to the next. Um, some say that he was throwing the tomahawk at a wolf that was threatening to attack the village. Um, and since he threw it into the night, he missed. And the next day, um, they went to go retrieve the tomahawk in the daylight. Other versions say he was simply in a throwing competition um, with a friend uh, and forgot about one of the uh, tomahawks that he threw into the side of the tree. Either way, the story goes that in the morning, his wife discovered that a container at the base of the tree where the tomahawk had hit into the bark had collected water that ran down from the cut of the tree and down the handle of the hatchet. So not uh, wanting to be wasteful, but also not wanting to go down all the way to the river to collect more water. Um, uh, Wokesis' his wife, she decided to use the water in preparing the evening meal. So she boiled it with some meat or um, whatever was being served that evening. She tasted the water and found that it was a little bit sweet and not too unpleasant. And so she continued to boil it down with the stew over several hours. And by the end, the familiar maple smell that we know today um, started emanating from it. And the entire community uh, really loved the meal and was over the moon by this new flavor. Um, so they decided to begin tapping more trees. So that is one common story that we hear. Um, and so although we may never know whether this story happened or not, um, it is likely that many communities learned from consuming maple sap from watching squirrels. Um, and before any of you are chuckling here, I've actually seen this on several occasions. It's quite, quite funny to watch, but in late winter, um, when squirrels' caches of nuts are at their lowest point and quite depleted, um, squirrels start climbing through the treetops and they'll even gnaw at the branches of sugar maples. And by scraping the bark, this allows sap to exude from this, the twig and the squirrels will lap it up. Um, and researchers studying this behavior have found that even the next morning, squirrels will return to the same spot on the tree and they will lick the icicles um, since the outside has the concentration of sap. Um, the freezing temperatures cause the water um, in the sap to sublimate, which leaves a really sweet crystallized um, sugar on the outside like rock candy. And so this provides squirrels with a boost of energy risk, rich sucrose um, at this time of year when their food reserves are lowest. Um, and the squirrel hypothesis actually shows up in our stories as well. So in the Potawatomi story of Nana Bozo, uh, there's a story where the winter lessons of the squirrel was to collect maple sugar from the maple trees. Um, there's also a story from the Abenaki community at Wolanak describing how red squirrels taught the Abenaki people um, how to collect maple syrup. So um, it's really interesting to see how there's this linguistic evidence and also um, this scientific evidence. So the Western Abenaki calendar is largely determined by when various foods become readily available. Um, or uh, it is dictated by the phenology of different um, 
major events uh, happening in the forests. Um, so the months of our calendar are counted by moons. And the first day of each new moon is the first day of the new month. And there's a corresponding name for each of the full moons according to what is happening. Um, for example, the time corresponding roughly to February is called Paiodongos, which means the making branches fall into pieces moon. And this is in reference to the fact that at this time of the winter, um, a lot of blizzards and potentially ice storms are happening. So uh, it was a time that more branches are physically breaking off of trees and falling uh, down to the ground. There's also the moon corresponding to May, which is Kikas, which, is, which means field maker moon, uh, which is a reference to when the fields would be good for sowing seeds. There's also um, the moon corresponding to September, um, which is Skamonkas, which is corn maker moon, referring to when uh, the flint corn that we traditionally plant would be ready for harvesting. But today I wanna to focus on um, what this illustration over here on the left side of the screen is showing, which is Sogalikas, which literally translates to the time of maple sugar making or the maple making moon. So maple sugaring was um, so important that it became one of these major anchoring events for our annual calendar. And this moon typically corresponds with the end of March, beginning of April. Um, so around the time that most people are sugaring today. And so during this moon, um, what would typically happen is winter Abenaki villages traditionally would disperse um, and the men would go out on hunting parties um, and then the group would move to a sugaring camp um, to make maple sugar and syrup. Um, so what's really interesting is families and sometimes entire villages uh, would set up wigwams um, in woods right next to the maple trees that they had been stewarding for generations. And these sugaring camps um, were really the center of the community until the end of the sugaring season. And something I always like to mention as well is that sugaring from an Abenaki perspective is matrilineal. So it was led by women uh, within the community. One of the first written accounts of Abenaki sugar making comes from um, Father Sebastian Rassel, who wrote on October 15th of 1722, while he was living among the Kennebec Abenaki community, quote, there is no lack of sugar in these forests. In the spring, the maple trees contain a fluid resembling that which the canes of the islands contain. The women busy themselves in receiving it in vessels of bark, which it trickles from these trees. They boil it and obtain from it a fairly good sugar. And as this um, quote is showing, uh, the women are the, the portion of the community who would have been leading these efforts. And I also spoke to um, anthropologist Matthew Thomas about this. Um, Dr. Thomas is author of over a dozen books and peer reviewed articles about the history of maple sugaring. And one of the way, main ways that he mentioned um, Abenaki sugar making uh, and indigenous sugar making in general differed from European systems was that quote, traditionally Native American women were the leaders of the operation. They ran the sugar bushes, made and repaired the baskets and boiled the sap. Women were the primary sugar makers. Unlike traditional European sugaring operations where men were delegated most, if not all of the collection pra practices from felling the wood to stoking the fire, um, Native American women were front and center during the sugaring season um, at Abenaki sugaring camps. And I should also mention that traditionally uh, different women within the community would be in charge of different swaths of the forest, um, not only coordinating the gathering of the sap that was happening there and repairing the, the sap um, birch bark containers, but also ensuring that the trees were healthy. The women ran the sugaring camps and although um, children and elders 
also helped out. Um, the, the process by which um, the sugar bush was transferred from daughter to mother over time was one of the most respected um, components of the traditional sugaring system. And so I, I would like to describe a little bit more about what the traditional process of sugaring looked like from the Beneke perspective. So when it came time for gathering maple sap, um, the spiles were traditionally made of um, cedar. So there are cedar spiles about uh, eight to nine inches long. Um, they might also be made of spruce as well. And these would be inserted into a diagonal incision on the side of the tree. Um, so these would work as what would be spigots today or um, the taps that we put into trees today to funnel the sap from underneath the bark um, and to drip down into uh, these pails. And the photograph that's on the right of this slide, um, this is a recreation of an Algonquin um, traditional sugaring setup uh, that was put on display at the 2015 National Maple Syrup Festival um, in Medora, Indiana. And this shows you an example of how multiple taps um, may have been used as well on a given tree. Um, so what we would also use in later times, uh, which is pictured on the left-hand side of the screen, this is actually from the Minnesota Historical Society's collection, um, were sumac sap spigots. So um, what's really cool, I've actually made one of these before, is if you take um, a piece of sumac, you can actually hollow out the center because there's this pith um, that comes right out. Uh, and you can create what is essentially a, a nice spile with this channel to help guide the sap down the length of it once it dries. So uh, in later uh, iterations of this or in places where they had access to sumac, um, this is also what they would be using. And I wanted to talk about another quote from Father Sebastian's writings. Um, he said, quote, the Abeniki women tend to two to 300 vessels in the morning while the fire is ablaze at camp. So imagine um, going out through the forest uh, and emptying the sap that's dropping into these birch bark containers. Um, and it wasn't just a few trees that were being tapped here. We're talking about uh, sometimes in the hundreds. So they could be uh, fairly large operations. And I wanted to focus on one particular um, technology that was traditionally used in our Arabeniki sugaring practices, um, which is misguajo. Um, this is the term that we use for specifically birch bark containers that are used for collecting maple sap. So these were specifically constructed for this purpose. But I want to describe to you the process that they were created because uh, it's a really good example of environmental knowledge. So they're made of birch bark, um, which is a perfect material because it's really pliable, but it's also really strong and durable once it dries. Um, birch bark also has uh, antimicrobial properties. So it helps prevent it from growing mold uh, when it is holding sap or when it is submerged in, in water. And to create this, the folded piece of birch bark um, are lashed together either with um, sinew or what we call watap. Um, so sinew is a piece of really tough fibrous tissue that um, connects muscles and bones or bone to bone. So it's either tendons or ligaments. Um, and the sinew thread was created by pounding the end of dried sinew from a killed animal. So whether it be a moose, a bear, or a deer, um, they would pound that with a rounded stone. Um, and this action causes the individual dried sinew fibers to break apart, um, to begin to separate because they're really intertwined to make that a very strong material. And you would repeat this beating process until the whole length of the sinew uh, would become uh, thinner strands for being able to sew with. Um, some containers were also made with uh, fibrous spruce roots, so roots from the spruce tree, um, which we call watap. And this process also involved multiple steps. Um, so you could create watap uh, using 
roots from different conifers, whether it be white spruce, um, black spruce, or cedar trees. Um, but what would happen is you would first collect the thin roots, you would debark them, and then they would be subjected to a pretty lengthy soaking process. And then they would be steamed or boiled to make them more pliable for sewing. Um, so the roots could be left whole and used as cords, or you could divide them into smaller fibers, similar to the process that I described for the sinew, um, to create smaller bits of twine. And Abeniki people um, were so good at this process, which I find endlessly fascinating because I've tried to make these before and they haven't always come out, is they used um, Watap to make uh, very strong and lightweight birch bark canoes, which could people could then sit in and navigate down rivers such as the Connecticut. So think about the amount of um, work that goes into just creating these, these containers. Uh, and then the last challenge was creating a container that was waterproof at its seams. So to accomplish this, um, we would traditionally use pitch from red spruce or other pine trees um, to mend those seams. And then the left-hand side, um, these are both images of items from uh, the Smithsonian uh, where I'm working right now um, from Abeniki communities. Um, the one on the left you'll notice looks very different. Um, so, Anthropologists historically called this um, macaque or macaque, um, which is just a general name for a birch bark container. But this is an example of the more elaborate and larger forms that they could take. So uh, Beniki communities could then store larger amounts of things such as sap or berries or meat inside of them. So in terms of the processing, um, the last step, after being poured into um, larger carrying containers and transported by odohogan, which is a word for um, sleds, um, they were taken to the sugar camps. And from there, the sap was boiled, um, boiled down in a uh, sequence of pots. Traditionally, these would be made from soapstone, um, but as contact with um, Europeans started in the 1600s, um, Abeniki peoples uh, readily adopted um, uh, kettles, metal kettles and pails um, for this purpose as well. But prior to that, um, we would have used um, most, most accounts or most anthropologists today think that we would have used uh, soapstone pots for this. Um, and this is an area of much controversy today. You may have seen um, presentations at um, cultural institutions or centers who are talking about the indigenous history of maple production who say that um, we would have warmed up rocks and then uh, dumped them into or put them into a container um, full of sap and repeatedly done that over and over again until the hot rocks um, would have boiled down the sap until the point that you get. Uh, maple syrup or ma maple sugar. Um, in fact, there are a couple of people who have uh, poked holes in this theory. One of them is Caleb Musgrave. Um, Caleb's an outdoor educator and an Anishinaabe man from Hiawatha First Nation um, in Ontario. And he's explored this hypothesis through experimenting with hot rocks. And he's shown um, time and again, alongside a growing amount of evidence from um, archaeologists and from anthropologists, that this process would have added a huge amount of ash to the sap, um, so much so that the resulting food would have been largely inedible. Um, and in addition to this, um, there's archaeological evidence that indigenous communities of the Northeast, including the Beniki, Iroquois, Penobscot, um, the Penacook, um, the Mi'kmaq, the Wampanoag, the Mohawk, among many others used clay or soapstone pots to boil soups and herbal medicines. So it seems only logical that we would have also used this for boiling the sap down. Um, and once it got to, to the point where it was about to be crystallized, it would be taken out and then paddled repeatedly in a low flat dish um, so it would form granulated sugar. And I want to include a colonist account of um, this maple sugaring process. Um, so there's an irony here. Um, if you look at the historical accounts of 
and, and descriptions of Abenaki communities from the 16, 17, 18, early 1900s, um, Europeans were really quick to call Abenaki people um, savage or backwards or um, not being of uh, equal capacity in their ability to understand technology. However, there are also accounts of um, Europeans who lived with the Beneke communities, either as captives or Jesuits who are working at missions, who found the process to be very challenging. Um, so one example is actually um, from Stephen Williams. Uh, and so Mr. Williams lived with an Abenaki Penacook family in Northeast Vermont following the um, raid of Deerfield during Queen Anne's War of 1704. And during his captivity, Williams wrote about the large quantities of sugar that they had made that year, as well as how he was reprimanded for spoiling the maple sugar after he didn't stir it properly during the final steps. Um, and he said, quote, or he writes, quote, Whilst I lived here, I made about four score weight of sugar with the sap of maple trees. Because there was a barrel of sap to boil, my mistress sent me to the sugar place overnight to boil it so that we might go in the morning. I went and kept a good fire under the kettle, little thinking of, the coming, of it coming to sugar till it was spoiled for want of stirring. And he goes on to discuss how um, this <laughs> event, he ended up getting um, a lot of chuckles and uh, people were kind of making fun of him um, because this was the point at which uh, it was really easy for the um, boiling process to go too far and to ruin, to ruin the sugar and burn it. And so I was wondering if all of you could put into the chat um, how you enjoy maple syrup today. Because um, I know there are so many different ways to use it. I've seen it in salad dressings. I've seen it used um, as a marinade for meat. Um, my family uses it uh, for all of these purposes and more, but I just wanted to first um, see how your family uses uh, maple syrup or maple sugar. Um, so I'll just open up the chat and see um, what is coming in on this. Oh, awesome. Okay, Angela's is salmon. That's great. Um, my family also smokes salmon. We love to baste it with maple syrup. Uh, pancakes, ooh, maple rhubarb pie from Diane. On oatmeal, yeah, oatmeal. I always like to start the day off with some maple syrup as well. And so with those in mind, um, from an Abenaki perspective, we would have been producing not maple syrup, um, the red water, as I said, uh, but we would be storing maple sugar. Um, the reason is because maple syrup is really heavy. It's a liquid, it's hard to transport. Whereas granulated maple sugar, you get a lot more bang for the per, per um, ounce of granulated sugar in terms of flavoring than maple syrup. And so uh, traditionally what we would do is we would store it in birch bark cones. Um, these would be packed until they are very tight and then would also have um, occasionally a uh, sash made out of sinew to carry them. So we could carry the sugar while we moved because again, traditionally our bands would be moving between uh, winter, winter hunting grounds and shelter grounds to fishing places, to the um, areas that would be good for growing flint corn, beans, squash, ground cherry, et cetera. So we needed to be able to move this uh, material as we went. But um, based off of oral traditions, uh, the maple sugar was used for all sorts of things. It was used for seasoning meats, particularly venison, bear, and snowshoe hares as well as fruits and vegetables. And um, there's even accounts of Abenaki people boiling it down with bear fat to create a sweet um, an energy packed, almost like a, a spread or jam um, that hunters could snack on for needed energy out in the woods. And maple is also used as an additive to some of our herbal medicines. Um, it not only makes them more palatable, but there are various ailments that traditionally um, would have been particularly targeted using um, maple sap. 
And other tribes traditionally used uh, maple for lots of other purposes. The um, Potawatomi traditionally allowed the sap to sour, which after which it was used as almost like a vinegar um, for cooking deer meat. And primarily the sugar prepared from the sap was used as a sugar, as a seasoning um, for these communities as well. Um, in particular, it was used in place of salt. And so um, maple sugaring shows up in many Abenaki stories, but one in particular of, is of Gluscape. Um, so you may have heard various forms of Gluscape's name. He's also called Gluscap, Glus, Glus, Gluskep, Gluscabi, uh, Gluscap, Gluscomba, or Gluscab. Um, all these words are just regional variations of the same figure who shows up in Wabeniki um, creation stories and our oral history um, across Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Maine, and the Atlantic um, can, uh, areas of Canada. And the Abeniki people believe that the um, Tabaldak who created humans, um, the dust from his body created Buscape and his twin brother, Malsumis. And Buscape uh, was given power to create a good world. He's very benevolent and likes to help um, communities and really wanted to help people to survive. On the other hand, um, Malsumis was uh, his um, alter ego, you could say, um, and he seeks to do evil um, and to tempt humans even to this day. So the story of Gluscape and the maple trees goes that thousands of years ago, creator made all sorts of gifts that were shared with humans so that they could live a full and a very meaningful life. And Creator was very wise. Um, they made sure to provide food to feed the Abeniki people during each of the seasons. And first, Creator provided the moose and the deer for the Abeniki to hunt during the long winter months, and then the berries and the fruits for picking in the summer and the spring. Finally, he led the waterfowl to return during their fall migrations so they could be hunted by canoe before the open water froze over during the winter. Among the many things they provided, Creator was created was um, especially pleased with having created the sugar maple tree, Senamosi, since its sap was as thick and as sweet as honey. Shortly after Creator made Senamosi, alongside the other provisions for the people, Gluskape traveled as an owl from one village to another to keep watch over the villages on creator, Creator's behalf. One day, Gluskape found a once thriving village in disrepair. The bean and the squash fields had become riddled with weeds and the fires had all been extinguished. Although he searched far and wide, he couldn't find the people anywhere in the village. As night descended upon the valley and he sat by the glowing embers of the fire, waiting to see if the people would return from hunting or gathering, a strange rumbling and gurgling sound drifted from the hills on the wind. Gluscape flew through the forest toward the source of the sound into a stand of maple trees. At the center of this stand, he found all the villagers lying on their backs and staring up into the sky. They were drinking maple sap. Their stomachs were full with the abundance of sugar that had made them unfit to move or to do any work. Gluscape told them to return to the village and tend to your gardens, your fires, and to care for your lands. But the people did not listen. They were happy to lie on their backs with their mouths open, guzzling the thick honey-like syrup. Gluscape shared this news with Creator, who was troubled to learn that the people no longer appreciated all the other joys of the forest. They were sad to see the people were no longer working together, but preferred to sit alone, drinking their sap through their days. In order to teach the people a lesson, Creator told Gluscape to transform into a cold northern wind. As Gluscape descended over the forests, the cold temperatures he brought with him caused the sap to stop flowing from the trees. Gluscape then swelled and swelled until he swept over the rivers and the lakes, lifting great, great amounts of water up into the sky. Gluscape carried this water to all the sugar maples across the forest and fed each of them until all the sap 
was diluted nearly 40 times. The next day when the people awoke to drink their beloved sap, they noticed it no longer flowed like thick honey. They asked Bushkape, the Stratli, where did our sugar go? Bushkape assured them that the sugar had not disappeared, but that now they would have to work hard and boil the sap to produce the golden liquid they loved so much. Upon hearing this, the people decided that they would spend the rest of their days among the sugar grove, boiling both during the day and all through the night so that they could continue to enjoy their steady supply of syrup. However, since Creator was very wise, they foresaw that the people might try to spend all their days admiring only the maple's gift. To prevent this, they made the sap stop flowing as soon as the leaves erupted from the maple's branches. From that day forward, the people could only harvest sap for a few weeks each year. And so it is still to this day, each spring, the flow of maple sap reminds the Abeniki people of Bushkape's lesson in honoring all of Creator's gifts and the importance of building a sense of community by working together. And so you may have noticed that this telling of the story is a bit different from other versions. Um, this was actually uh, transcribed from a story that my grandfather told me around the grandfather uh, around um, the uh, campfire growing up, and I decided to to write it down. Um, and I think this is a really interesting story in particular because it shows how the maple trees are intertwined with our moral teachings. They teach us not only the importance of honoring all of Creator's gifts, so all the components of the ecosystem, but they also show the importance of continually stewarding the lands, making sure that you are continually in good relation with the forests. And so to end today, um, I wanted to talk about some of the lessons that maples teach us. They connect us to um, impacts from the past, and they also connect us to future generations. One way that I've had this described to me is when we keep in mind where we are going to tap a given tree from one year to the next. The, the saying goes that you never want to tap in the same place twice because it can lead scar tissue on the sugar maple. Um, this simple act of thinking about where you place a hole um, or the tap uh, on the tree itself, it really makes you pause and reflect on how people have interacted with that tree in the past. And you know that if you tap the tree too much in a given year, then it can damage it and you won't have as much sap flowing in the future. So sugaring um, is often discussed in this context of intergenerational transfer of natural resources. It also teaches us that true leaders are the first to give their gifts. In many indigenous communities, um, the maple is considered the leader of the trees. And it's also interesting to note that as the leader, it is the first to readily give of its gifts, especially during the time of year that people are the most in need of food. And so this reminds us that if we are to be leaders, we need to be mindful of how we are providing for people. We are not to be rooted in power and authority as Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, um, but in service and wisdom. Maples also teach us that hard work combined with gratitude produce the greatest rewards. And this is really shown in our story of Bushkape, um, where people have to go out, work together, and make sure that they are in good relations with the land in order to enjoy the sweet reward, which is maple syrup. Um, and Gluskape's story also reminds us that we can't take nature's gifts for granted. The greatest gifts are truly those that require us to work and require us to give of our time and energies to make something more. And um, maples also teach us that we must be humble. No matter how hard you work and how much energy you pour into maple sugaring, the climate in a given year 
whether there are pests the previous summer, so like caterpillar, caterpillar outbreaks, et cetera, and the general health of the forest is the ultimate um, determining factor in how much sap you can produce in a given year. And with that comes a certain recognition that we are at the whims of the natural world. Um, we cannot control all the factors and we cannot control how much maple syrup we produce um, to a certain extent. And I always like to think of when I'm speaking with sugarers today, it seems as though they are the first to call upon this recognition that sugaring is dependent upon the health of the entire forest ecosystem and is tied with the health of the climate system itself. Um, because maple sugaring hasn't been replicated in say a greenhouse setting before that's very separated from the forest. And then finally, reciprocity. Um, I wanted to include this, this quote as well from Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, where she talks about the example of carbon as shared currency. The currency of carbon dioxide, she says, we share and exchange carbon dioxide among organisms in the ecosystem and with the atmosphere. Uh, eventually, from the atmosphere, it's borrowed by the trees. Uh, we then cut the trees down where it's released back into the atmosphere by burning the wood to make syrup. So a sugar bush provides a really good example of reciprocity and balance, making sure that um, we are in good relations with the forest, not cutting too much, thinning too much, but also um, we need to be thinking about the non-material benefits that are provided by maple trees, um, filtering the air and um, producing oxygen, for example. And I want to end with this today. Why might it be important to know the indigenous history of maple sugaring? First, um, recognizing and celebrating the indigenous history of maple sugaring can really serve as a way to build connections between indigenous and non-indigenous communities around something that we both love. Um, Vermonters across the board love maple and it's a great conversation starter. At the start of this presentation, we had folks sharing about their own experiences in relation to these trees and the woods and growing in their backyards. Um, although the reasons that we like maple syrup might be different at their core, um, considering whether they're tied to our spiritual and cultural beliefs or not. On the surface, we can all agree that the trees offer really valuable gifts and we all love maple syrup. So I think it has a really uh, important role as a unifying factor in a way. Knowing this history also serves as an in for more difficult and equally important conversations. Um, so knowing the indigenous history of maple sugaring um, can be a really good entry point for especially schools who are starting to begin those conversations about the more difficult aspects of history, like colonization, um, including land dispossession, um, violence against indigenous communities, and access to natural resources. Um, there are already quite a few schools, including um, my alma mater, um, where we have working sugar bushes and students are starting to build relationships to the land and to talk about the importance of local food production and local indigenous communities through the act of producing maple sugar and maple syrup. And then third, um, I believe that understanding this history can help in combating harmful stereotypes. As I explained with the example of just creating these birch baskets, um, having this strong understanding and ability to produce maple syrup requires a high degree of sophisticated um, technological and environmental knowledge. So it helps to fight stereotypes that indigenous peoples prior to European con uh, contact were somehow backwards or archaic um, or primitive or couldn't um, produce materials in this uh, complex materials in the same way that um, Europeans could. And then finally, um, it helps to fight the erasure of indigenous history. 
Um, far too often, the only parts of indigenous history that are taught in our schools and even in museums today is history of the famous um, uh, tribal leaders who interacted with Europeans. In this way, we can shift the focus to the everyday Native American, as I say, um, the people who are continuing to do maple sugaring in their communities, as well as the women who traditionally have been the backbone of continuing this cultural practice. Today, our tribe um, produces uh, maple syrup at our um, tribal forest, which we acquired in 2012. Um, it's located in Barton, Vermont. And I want to uh, really thank the Vermont Land Trust and the Vermont Conservation and Housing Board, as well as the Sierra Club who helped us in acquiring this land. Um, it actually became the first tribal land in the state to be owned by a tribe in almost 200 years. Um, and to this day, um, we produce maple syrup uh, with tribal members. It's a moment for us to get together and learn about the history and cultural importance of maple sugaring, as well as to practice speaking our traditional language. Um, so in this way, it is a form today of continued cultural practice. And I'll breeze over these last three because I know we're uh, running over time, but I'm also really interested as um, somebody coming from a science background of how climate change is going to impact sugaring practices. We know from uh, current studies and past climate data and surveys from across the country that climate change is going to um, shift the distribution of uh, sugar maples and red maples in the United States with generally um, conditions that are favorable for those trees growth shifting northwards over time as our climate begins to warm. Climate change is also projected to change the timing of when uh, maple syrup uh, can be made. Um, by 2100, for example, some studies have shown that maple sugaring uh, will begin one month earlier than it did between 1950 and 2017. Today, um, sap is already flowing an average of 8.2 days earlier, and sap stops running on average 11.4 days earlier than it did just 40 years ago. So think about that's a 10% loss in the length of the sugaring season since my parents graduated from high school. And then climate change is also going to change the sugar concentration of the sap. So the concentration of uh, sucrose in maple sap is really dependent on this balance between respiration or the usage of energy reserves um, and photosynthesis, which is the storage of these sugar reserves. And science has shown us that, and experiments have shown us that as average temperature increases, um, sugar, tree, sugar producing trees respire more and thus their reserves of sucrose decrease. They're more stressed and as a result, the bricks content or the sugar content in the sap will be going down. So this all means that we'll have to work harder in the future to make the same amount of sap. So what does this mean for our communities and our culture as climate change threatens to fundamentally disrupt maple sugaring? And I want to leave you all with this quote from again, braiding sweetgrass. We can assign an economic value to maple timber, our gallons of syrup, but ecosystem services are far more precious. And yet these services go unaccounted for in the human economy. As with the services of local government, we don't think about them unless they are missing. There is no official tax system to pay for those services as we pay for snow plowing and school books. We get them for free, donated continually by the maples. They do their share for us. The question is, how well will we do by them? And so we think about not just the loss of delicious maple sugar and maple syrup. When I think about climate change, I see the loss of culture, the loss of ways of relating to the land, a loss of community, 
and a loss of respect for the area that we call home. And all of this is to say, I, I hope this presentation today shows you how maple trees and the process of maple sugaring is really important to me as an Abenaki person. And I really hope that in the future, we will work to advocate for maple trees. So what can you do to help? I encourage you to teach and share the indigenous history of maple sugaring in your circles um, so that we can help to combat stereotypes um, and also give credit where credit is due for the people who eventually taught Europeans how to um, create maple syrup today. Also donate, donate to the Abenaki Land Link Project, which is a project run by the Nohican um, Band of the Kosok Abenaki Nation, where we partner with um, uh, farmers from across the state and landowners to grow foods ranging from squash to corn, which we then distribute among tribal, tribal members, as well as local food banks. So this is an act of promoting um, food sovereignty. Also donate to the Vermont Land Trust um, because this organization has been very supportive of Abenaki communities and in protecting forests and food production across the state of Vermont. For instance, there's a project going on in my hometown right now, Left Side Farm, where my mom and other members of the Abenaki community have been invited out for plantings, for working on that land, which is a site of meeting and sustenance for our people um, for a very long time. And so I'm very grateful to the work that the Vermont Land Trust does. And then finally, advocate. Advocate for climate solutions at your local and state level, whether this be taking individual actions like getting that electric car, which the next presentation in this series will be about or really pressuring your legislature, legislators and calling them up, sending them letters, let them know that climate change is something that's important to you and that you care about. Make it known that your vote is partially dependent on whether or not people prioritize um, acting to combat climate change in their policies. And so thank you everybody um, for sticking with me today. Um, and I was wondering if there are any questions. Thanks so much, Alexander. Um, that was really great. I loved all your braiding sweetgrass quotes. I love Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, we had some comments and questions kind of as you went along. Um, and I wanted to go back to one from Nadine that touches on what you were just talking about with climate change. Um, we had a response to it in the chat, but I just wanted to make sure you got the chance to respond. So she wrote, I discovered maple syrup when I moved to the US from Switzerland. I'm a huge fan of maple syrup and I use it every day. The making of syrup is an old tradition that has been passed through many generations. It is labor of love. And I have a lot of respect for the people who continue this tradition and the hard work. There are not many places in the world where such weather conditions are such that maple syrup can be made. Do you think that climate change might make maple, maple syrup, sorry, might make maple syrup obsolete someday? Um, and I know you touched on a lot of that, but I just wanted to make sure you heard her comment. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I tend to call myself a very optimistic person. Um, I am of the mindset that if we change our ways, we can make a huge difference and combat climate change. And I'm really um, emboldened and empowered by thinking about how younger generations prioritize taking climate action. This being said, looking at the data, if we continue on the track that we currently are with carbon emissions, it is unfortunately very likely that this is talking on the scale of the next 150 years or so, but still within a lifetime, lifetime plus some change, um, it's very likely that over large swaths or portions of the state, if we don't change our ways within the coming years, that very little maple syrup will be able to be produced. Um, and part of, part of the reason for that is one, we have changing soil characteristics. So maples actually require, they're quite finicky in the types of soil that they need. They need to have moist and medi like medium level of nutrient soils. 
Um, and as uh, average temperatures increase, we're seeing uh, changes in soil types that are less conducive um, for these trees to survive. Also, uh, there's something I didn't mention in this presentation that's also encroaching northward and marching northward with climate change, um, which is the Asian longhorned beetle um, and other invasive pests that are going to be um, attacking not only maple trees, but also other species of trees that are inhabiting the same forests. And most people, um, another thing that is uh, really interesting to think about in terms of maple production is from talking with sugarers, I've actually found um, anecdotal evidence and people are starting to research this as well, but in forests that have more complexity of species, um, they're actually more buffered against influxes of pests and um, other events that would negatively impact maple trees. And so we not only have to think of the health of maple trees, but the health of other trees within the ecosystem. Um, and so unfortunately, my answer to that question, sorry, that was a long winded answer, but um, my answer is, if we don't change our ways, things are looking very grim um, within a couple generations of uh, producing maple syrup in Vermont. Um, the optimal range for sugar production is moving northward. So actually people in Quebec may be benefiting from, if you look at it in a short run frame of mind in terms of producing gallons of maple syrup, um, people in, in Quebec may benefit. But in the long run, if we don't change, um, it's very unlikely that we, we will be able to produce uh, very much um, maple sugar in the next 200, 300 years. Thank you, Alexander. Um, and thanks for such a holistic and really interconnected program. It was great. Um, and also for all the people who have shared their thoughts about maple sugaring in the chat, thank you. Um, the next question that came up was related to what you were just saying. And basically it's a more generic question about maple trees, which is aren't maple trees on the decline in New England? Yes. Um, so actually, I'm gonna see if I can pull up this last slide, but um, there's a really interesting study that came out in 2019. Um, and it's essentially, let's see if I can reshare my screen. Um, so this is the kind of take home, uh, the main take home message is in this figure from this, this article. Um, but what it's showing is that within um, within the, the next couple of years, I mean, within the next decades, um, the uh, importance value, which is essentially a metric of how prevalent, in this case, sugar maples are within stands of a forest, um, the importance value of sugar maple trees is going to be diminishing across the Northeast. And already we have been, there's evidence that has shown indeed that um, conditions that are optimal for sugar maples um, have declined over the past 20 or 30 years. And part of that as well as in other parts of the Northeast um, in particular, there are invasive pests that have already started to attack maple trees. Um, so the short answer to that is yes, there's already evidence showing that uh, maple trees are on the decline um, and are increasingly stressed. Um, believe it or not, uh, there's lines of evidence suggesting that uh, sugar maples are starting to exhibit um, signs of uh, drought stress, which we often don't think about in the context of the Northeast. We usually think about drought in the context of the Western United States. But um, again, when we get these longer spells of time um, during really important parts of the tree's life cycle of growth, for instance, when it's trying to um, sequester more carbohydrates and sucrose, which it will then use for bud break the following year. If that period falls within a time that the tree is experiencing longer periods without um, substantial rainfall, then it is less able to sequester those, those carbon reserves um, for then bud break the next year. And over time, that is compounded with these, unfortunately, really devastating uh, impacts by invasive pests. So it's not just a one, one um, 
sided assault uh, from climate change. We have an assault from pests that are able to move and survive in warmer temperatures and move northward. It's also from changing soil characteristics. It's even from, there's evidence showing that a decline in snowpack is really harmful to sugar maples. Uh, we often think of cold weather as being detrimental for plants, but a lot of plants have adapted to having a cold um, part of the year and then a warm part of the year. And part of that for maples is they found that it's really beneficial to have a thick snowpack during those midwinter, really cold, um, below 10, 20 below zero events. Um, it helps to insulate those roots that are close to the soil surface and prevents them from being injured. And so as, as our amount of snowfall and snowpack is also decreasing, that also leads to more damage for maple trees. So yeah, that's correct. Um, maple trees are already experiencing um, some decline across the, the um, Northeast. Thank you. And yeah, this graphic is really helpful. Um, can't see the name here. Aubrey writes, I'm very glad you are optimistic. Where do you find your hope? What are some of the things that inspire you to climate action as opposed to scare you into it? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think one thing I've been thinking about recently is we often think of climate action as something that needs to be done on an individual scale. So oftentimes people are told if you stop using plastic water bottles, um, then, and we all do that individually, then we will collectively make change. Or if you um, don't ride your car into work, you just choose to bike, then you will be combating climate change. And all those things are true, but I think the evidence shows that what we need is community and government level action as well. And part of that is to make that change, we need to come together as a community. And unfortunately, our society is increasingly polarized um, and we're unable to see each other across the political aisle. Um, but I see within, uh, there's been a shift where people are talking about the negative impacts of that polarization now. It was something that was happening and I feel like now people see how it's, it's preventing us from taking environmental action. We need to focus on community. And so what gives me hope, I would say, is I think the places I've worked at are actually starting to focus on communicating those community level actions as opposed to just individual level actions. And they're also starting to focus on how can we build community around caring for places. And I think especially during the pandemic in a time where we've all been separated and um, I mean, rightfully so, we had to, to distance from one another for each other's safety. Um, the importance of community became more acutely aware and so for me, I draw inspiration from, I'm seeing a lot more conversations in the work that I'm doing about um, inspiring community level change. So sharing stories of how communities have worked together to propose climate solutions, as opposed to just saying, it's up to you. It's up to, instead it, the conversation is starting to shift towards, it's up to our community. And I find that, I, my person, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that that will be the point at which we start to make some real change is it, when people start um, thinking about their place within community and working together. Um, so yeah, I, find, I draw inspiration from this shift from the individual to community connections. I think that was all the questions that we have. I think you answered most of the questions that Pete and anticipated them during your talk. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. There's lots of appreciation for you um, in the chat. Um, thank you, people thanking you. Your knowledge and efforts are appreciated. Um, so that's great to see. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing 
all of this with us, Alexander. I think thank everyone... you for having me. And thank you, everybody. Um, Uliani, thank you so much um, just for coming out to this and for staying to, to talk about this topic. It's um, really exciting for me um, to see that there's a group like this that is interested in taking sustainable action. So um, this is awesome. All right. Well, happy sugaring season, everyone, and have a good evening. <laughs>